Summits on the Air Soda, as everybody calls it. Uh, it's basically it's a it's a contest. It's like a it's a whole lot like Islands on the Air. The difference is uh, you don't have to go to an island to do it. Uh, any, anyway, the uh, I'm gonna go through some of these details and give you a little bit of the history here. Uh, you know, there's nothing new. Uh, amateur radio operators going to the top of mountains and operating, setting up stations and operating them. Been doing that for years. It's just now there's a sort of a sport aspect that goes along with this. Uh, and for anybody that had done a stint in the military a long time ago, which I have not, but the guy I worked for, you, they used to do some of this kind of stuff uh, as training. Uh, the Marine Corps used to go find USGS or geodetic survey markers and set up and you know plan out ordnance attacks from various places to practice uh, geometry. And uh, the Brits did the same thing too, and there's some discussion that maybe that's how some of this got started because a lot of those guys were ham radio operators. But basically, you go to you go to the top of a mountain, make contacts. Uh, it's a it's sort of a loose, uh, loosely uh, put together organization of uh, databases. Everything's run on the web. It's all in the honor system. Uh, there's not any paperwork to send in or whatever. Uh, but the stats down here at the bottom, what's interesting, it says 55 participating uh, countries and nearly 60,000 peaks. That has grown to almost uh, uh, 70 countries and almost 100,000 peaks. This, this presentation is a little old. Uh, here's a uh, QSL card uh, from uh, N0B. If anybody has been in SOTA or spent any time on YouTube looking at interesting activations, you'll see WG0AT, Goat Man, as everybody calls him, Steve, who activates with a uh, donkey uh, uh, there, or a goat. He's got a donkey and a goat and, and, a, and a, some sort of pack horse he's got. That's Peanut. And if you spend any time you know, on the airways listening to these guys, you'll see these guys. Uh, you'll hear him talking about his goats. Uh, here's an example of an activation. Uh, Snowden Peak in Great Britain. He's operating two meter simplex. Uh, he also has a 10 gigahertz radio there. Uh, kind of a, a pretty nice setup he's got there. There's a fat guy on Tatum Mountain there, uh, y'all might know uh, with my dog. Uh, that's over near Fort Mountain State Park. Tatum Lead, anybody that used to do four wheeling over in that part of the world, uh, that's, that's where that is. We set up over there one uh, cold Saturday morning. Here's a guy I know, uh, this is in uh, Oklahoma, and a site that you can drive close to the top uh, and get out there and work, and he's got a great setup that he sets up with a fishing pole uh, and runs. Just some, just some uh, examples. What is it? It's an award program for amateurs and shortwave listeners uh, that encourages portable operation. You don't have to you don't have to go on mountaintops to be a part of it. You can be a, someone sit, uh, sit in a shack. They call those chasers. Uh, so it's kind of works for anybody and everybody depending on the level of skill. But if you like to hike and you like to do portable QRP type operation, this is a great, uh, this is a great uh, activity. I was introduced to this not from a chaser uh, or activator standpoint, but a guy that I know that's a big shortwave listener this is something he did and sort of that's how I got introduced to it. And of course I started participating, I love to hike. Uh, this is based in Great Britain, but every, uh, every country and association has a little different twist on it. Obviously there are different mountain heights in different parts of the world, but there's a basic set of rules for everybody. Uh, the United States is an exception, of course, as we often are to many things. Uh, we don't have just one association with the United States. There are so many, uh, the U.S. is so big that every state has its own association. So there's a set of Georgia peaks, a set of Tennessee peaks, a set of North Carolina peaks. Uh, and you, the points you make are based on the height of the uh, summit that you activate or you chase. Uh, like I said, it's all internet based. And it's a lot like islands on the air if you've ever participated in that. Here's some of the associations I just picked. Uh, off the web page, uh, and you'll see why the, the letters and numbers here are important. Georgia is W4G, that's the association for Georgia, Tennessee W4T, uh, real original. Uh, you see England, Wales, 
all these other, this is just a, there are more in the United States. I just picked a, a group of these. Anyway, these are places where people go activate uh, and do this. Uh, you get lucky when you're doing an activation and you get someone in another country just because of the equipment that you're using. Uh, I'm gonna get in a little bit of the details here and why it's important. Some of these things uh, that people get confused when they start this. Basically, what you do when you activate a, uh, when you do a soda activation, you find, a, you go online, you find a summit from the Georgia Association a good one around here that I activated not too long ago is Johns Mountain. It qualifies as a peak. It has to have meet some certain qualifications to do that. But essentially, you make it to the top. You get close to the activation zone, which would be within so many feet of the actual tip top of the mountain. And you have to walk there. You can't just drive right up and hop out and operate. So you have to walk the last into the activation zone, the last 150, 200 feet or so. You can't operate from your vehicles power supply, you can't use a, your you know, vehicle's radio. You have to, everything you have to do, has, you have to carry it on your back or somehow with you. That includes power supplies, antennas, whatnot. Uh, John's Mountain's easy to do. And uh, we got up there and had terrible conditions. And because of where it was, I ended up getting a number of, you only have to make four contacts to count. I was able to do everything on two meter simplex. There was just, there was no 20 meter, uh, no 20 meter propagation that day. But I, I mentioned one of the things you, that you've got to do is you have to go to a peak that's been, that's an approved peak and it's been rated and has a point value associated with it. So what does that qualify? When we started doing this in Dalton, there were a bunch of places we thought we would go and activate, but they didn't qualify. And like Doug Gap Mountain doesn't qualify. It doesn't have a prominence that's so high. And that was very confusing to me as to what that, as to what that means, uh, but well, I've got a slider, we'll kind of go over that. The other thing, it has to be a summit that you can get to. If it's, if it's on private property, you need to have permission or you'll get, you'll get shot. Uh, and Native American government properties, if there's any sort of, uh, of uh, protected wetland or protected uh, burial ground or protected tribal area, you have to have permission to do that. There's not that much of that around here. That Tatum Mountain picture, that is private property, and I actually got permission to do that. Uh, but those are, the two, those are the two biggest things. Let's talk about the, what qualifies as a prominence. Now this is gonna be a little bit confusing. Uh, let's look at the, the bottom right-hand uh, picture here. There's three peaks there, uh, and you see the ones on either side qualify, but the one in the middle doesn't. And the way that's rated is, it's 150 meters would, is what qualifies a prominence. Well, the peak that's in the middle, from the top of the peak to the last contour line that is not shared with any other peak is only uh, 50 meters down. So it doesn't qualify. The one on the right, uh, you know, from 280 meters to 500 meters, that's more than 150 meters that qualifies. And of course, one on the left, it's 200 meters from the lowest uh, contour line that's not associated with anything else. The picture in the top left, which is not the same three peaks, I just wanted to illustrate sort of what, the, what that means. And these are mountains up in Maine, so they won't rec nobody <laughs> recognize the name of them probably, but this Albert Hill on the left, it's 430 feet elevation. Well, as the contour line stepped down to 370 feet there elevation, that's the last contour line that's not shared with another part of the map. You know, the, the, the next contour down is shared with another peak or the one next to it. So that's how you measure the prominence from the lowest contour interval that is not shared by another top. The, that's clear as mud, uh, I'm sure. The good thing is, is you don't have to figure this out on your own. Uh, that's already done for you, but that's a, that's a good definition of, of, of what soda qualifies as prominence. If you look up topographic prominence in the dictionary, it's a little different, but that's what they use. Stan, what got me on that when I asked you about Chestnut Mountain? Not being a, not being a mountain? It's not, it's, it's not a peak, and it's the highest peak in that area. Well, and, you know, Doug Gap, you know, I, I thought, wow, but there again, it's Middle Mountain doesn't count, Hurricane Mountain, all those are just long ridge tops, really. Uh, 
just like a, over in a Chats with Dugan Mountain, everybody thought, oh, that'd be great because it's got a great trail up, but it doesn't have a high enough prominence. The, uh, so how do, you, how do you get scored? In Georgia, here's the scoring range there from one to 10 points. Every association is one to 10 points. If it's in Colorado, 10 points starts at 14,000 feet and above. Georgia, it's 4,100 feet. Uh, only way to make it fair, because if you didn't do it here on the east of the Rockies, would everything be one point. So uh, every state's a little different. Uh, in the, some of the states in the Midwest, Oklahoma and some of those places, it's amazing what you get 10 points for. Uh, but in Georgia, uh, this is what it is. I'm going to show you a little map here. The only way you can get additional points, if you activate a summit, you get 10 points. No matter how many contacts you make, you get 10 points. If you're a chaser and you make contact with a guy who's on a summit, you get, say, 10 points, and that's all you get. And if he, act if he talks to 500 people or four people, it's 10 points. You can't reactivate that same summit in the same year. Uh, you have to, it's not like the uh, National Parks competition. You have to go back. You have to wait at least 12 months to go back again for yourself to do it. Now, if you're a chaser and somebody activates it and the next day somebody different activates it, you still get the points. So that's the kind of the difference there. Uh, the, only the only way you can get additional points is says seasonal bonus. If North Georgia still is considered a place that has, has uh, snowy winters, if uh, there are certain peaks, if they're above the uh, 3,700 foot elevation in Georgia, uh, between December and March, if you activate those, you get an additional three points because it could be snowy. So a little, get a little extra challenge there for it. So for around here, that's good because it doesn't often snow uh, and you can get those extra three points for doing that. Now, the good thing is, is the, the website, when you go log all your contacts, keeps up with this automatically and it'll tell you how many points you have. I've got a blown up picture of this, might be a little better. This is our area where we live. And in Georgia, Georgia has three mountainous regions. This is called the, this is where we live, is the historic high country. And I don't know if the mountains have been here longer than the rest. Of, I'm not sure why they call it that, but uh, you can see Eton, Cleveland, Dalton, Resaca, Calhoun, Adairsville. The three red triangles are the three ten pointers in this part of the world. Uh, that's Cowpen Mountain, Bald Mountain, and Big Bald Mountain over outside of LJ. Uh, they are all fairly easy to get to. They're either on a trail or close to a trailhead. Uh, the, you get over here towards Calhoun, you'll see the two there to the, uh, there's onesies and twosies. One of those is, uh, is John's Mountain, and one is Ball Mountain, is that the way you pronounce it? Ball Mountain is a one. Uh, fairly easy to get to. Uh, somebody asked me the other day about where's Grassy Mountain. It ought to be a, uh, it's an eight pointer. If you see the, the two ten, the two orange triangles there, the one to the left, the little yellow triangles, and eight to the left there, that's, that's Grassy Mountain. And there's, there's a blue one up there, almost to the Tennessee line there. It's a four. It's an unnamed peak. Uh, it is uh, this, uh, the number's 20, 24, 42 or something like that. It doesn't have a, even have a name. Uh, and I have yet to figure out how to get to it without just bushwhack and you know turn off the road and walk in three miles up the side of a mountain so but those that's around here as you go on uh, to the east there obviously there are more peaks this is just sort of the area where we live uh, but you'll be surprised as to what is not counted as a mountain you see in Dalton that whole the whole Doug Gap range there through Dalton there's nothing on it uh, where the Disney trail is and all that it does not consider a peak because of the prominence but, yes, sir. Just a quick question. In QST, I see they often are uh, QRP operators. Do you have to be QRP? No, no. That's just, most people are because of the equipment that you can carry. Uh, I do mostly QRP, and it's all about the battery power. How much can you, how much can you tote with you? Uh, I run, I don't run a, I run a sort of a non-traditional, I guess, setup. I run a little MFJ 9420. And with a fully charged battery, it puts out 12 watts. And it'll operate down to about seven watts 
on eight or nine volts and it finally just stop. It'll work till it, it'll just stop transmitting. Uh, but that's just because I couldn't carry, I just can't carry a lot more battery with me. Even with some of the new, the lithium iron phosphate, uh, which is a whole lot lighter, it's still constrained to that. So a lot of folks just do that because that's, you know, that's why. I know where to get the radios, but where do I get the goat? The goat, that's, that's the, uh, we'll have to talk to Steve there. The, uh, the, uh, <laughs> Now, if you ever, you ought to go watch some of his YouTube videos. Uh, it's called Goatberry Productions, but he has, he takes both those goats and loads them up with lots of equipment. He can do some QRO operation when he wants to with some pretty elaborate, elaborate antennas. How do you participate? Uh, like I said, there's, there's basically three folks. There's the activator, that's the guy that climbs the peak and the chaser. That's the guy that sits in the shack and, uh, and makes the contact and logs it. And then shortwave listeners. Uh, and the website gives you opportunities when you do all this. It'll ask you what, you what you've done, the name of the peak that you activated, all, those, all that information. And the database tracks all of that. So if, if I were to activate a peak and you say that you, uh, it's a whole lot like logbook of the world. As long as our dates and times line up, uh, it gives everybody credit for it. Uh, and over time, as your points accumulate, you can, you can uh, win an award. The website, sutter.org.uk, uh, that has anything and everything you want to see. Uh, you'll see parts of this presentation because I plagiarized most of it the, uh, from the website. The, uh, but it has everything you need to know. The, see all the maps, the associations, the copy of the rules. There's also a copy of the rules for Georgia, which are almost like any other state except for the one, the the seasonal bonuses for winter and two, the, the peak heights. Everything else in Georgia is pretty, uh, pretty similar to any other state, including Great Britain, where this was originated. All you need is a login. There's no cost involved. You uh, activate your call sign and you set up an account and you can start entering in your, uh, your QSOs. Here's a, it has its own spot collector and spotting page. This is an old one, uh, and I'm, for some reason there's no U.S. ones on here. They're all British and French for some reason. But the, the uh, go to the website, go to the date. You can either do it live or you can type in a, a past date if you want to see if you actually log somebody. You can do a future date, and it'll show you upcoming activations if someone has set that up in advance. But it will tell you, it'll give you as much information as the activator wants you to see. And sometimes these guys that are kind of hardcore will just say, hey, I'm on, there's the peak name, the, an association name and mountain number, and I'm on 20 meters, find me. They, a lot of guys do that kind of stuff, but most of the time, by the time you've climbed up to the top of a hill, you want people to know where you are. So you'll put, you know, put a couple of frequencies out there and hope when you get there, they're clear. If you're lucky enough to have cell phone uh, service when you're there, you can, there's a little app called Soda Goat. Uh, there's the goat thing again. Uh, that'll let you just, you know, you put in your activation and it puts it on, it'll, it'll upload it here for you automatically. Uh, or you contact somebody and ask them to spot you, which is, you, most of these places you don't have cell phone service anyway. But hey, you've got a radio so you can talk to somebody. Uh, here's an example. Uh, you see these numbers out here to the side, the top up there, this GW stroke SW-022. That's an associate, that's country association and peak number. Here's one for Georgia Bald Mountain, one of the 10 pointers here. Uh, W4G is the association, HC is the historic high country for Georgia, and then Bald Mountain's number three in that, uh, in that association. It's numbered by lowest to highest, so it's the third highest in the historic high country section. Uh, it tells you a little bit about it. it, tells you the latitude and longitude of the peak, uh, the locator, sunrise and sunset, whenever I took this screenshot, gives you a list of the activators over here on the side who's been there before. Uh, like I said, you can activate, if you activated a summit yesterday, I can activate it today. That's okay, I just can activate the same thing and get points for it twice in a year. Uh, but some people upload stuff. Here's a you know, GPS track that somebody posted here. Here's how I got there, some pictures of what I did when I was there. And there's always some interesting notes about what people have done. Uh, this K4 KPK is the association manager for the state of Georgia now. And he's, he's made it to 40 or so peaks and 
northwest Georgia. Uh, he likes to hike a lot. Uh, he always has good dried ups. And then over here in the corner, it tells you uh, the QSOs that have been, you know, that were logged from there. And you can see 20 meters uh, is a big one. Uh, but, and most people just because there again, 20 meters is a good band to run. Don't need a whole lot of antenna to do that. And folks look for you there. It's kind of a, it's kind of a common place to look for in the upper end of the 20 meter band. Uh, there's that fat guy again. The, uh, <clears throat> Here's the honor roll for uh, for chasers. Uh, this is uh, this is a 2012. Uh, but the guy at the top here, N4EX, he's part of the uh, North Carolina Association. But the number of activators chased uh, is 2,639. He scored 12,900 points. So at the time, he was the number one in the country. That's a whole lot of that's a whole lot of uh, summits at seven, eight, nine, ten points a pop. Uh, and it goes downhill from there, uh, you can see. So this guy has won several times ago. He's a chaser, so he sits in his shack. They call those guys shack sloths. If you make it to a thousand points, you get a sloth award <laughs> for sitting in your shack. Uh, activator honor roll, these are guys that have gone out and actually you know, activated uh, peaks. Uh, here's a couple of different, I pulled uh, there's Texas over there just Interesting stuff there, not a whole lot of hills in Texas, but uh, the guys there, uh, there is a overall activator honor roll for everything. I did not pull that up, but you can see uh, as of 2012, some of these guys over here in the middle, uh, call signs there, 100 summits, 111 summits, 175 summits. Uh, these guys have been busy and you can see the points associated with those and seasonal bonus points. There again, seasonal bonus points are usually because of uh, cold weather. Out west, uh, there are certain times of the year, uh, heavy rain events where rains may come up uh, out in the Midwest and it's dangerous to be somewhere. That's all, you also get points for those too. Yes? We got some hills, it's just a long way between. <laughs> Well, it's hard to say. It's hard to say in Georgia that you have mountains in Georgia, so it's a compared to the Rockies. That's right. That's right. Mounds. That's a. That's right. We we've been talking about the awards. Uh, here's the. Uh, here's what. Here's the. Uh, you get a certificate, and when you make it to the Mountain Goat, which is the activator for a thousand points, or the Shack Sloth for a thousand points, you get this crystal block. Real sexy, looks like one of those airbags that comes in like an Amazon package. But hey, you know that's the that's the award. But the uh, gift certificate and the certificates you can print out for starting at 100 and go on from there uh, to put on your wall there. The uh, your first uh, mountain goat award is free. After that, you have to pay for them. So kind of like the WRL, you got to buy your own buy your own award there. So so how do you get started? What do you got to do? Uh, in Great Britain, uh, VHF is used a bunch on single sideband. Uh, here, not so much. Uh, like I said, I've done some two meter FM. We did Johns Mountain, we did Simplex, and on Bald Mountain, uh, KK4 EGW and I went up there, and he turned to 146.52 and just, you know, on five watts on an HT, said, hey, anybody there? and drummed up a whole bunch of business all, of, all at once. That was kind of unusual. So, uh, so it is done. HF seems to be the, uh, at least in the US, predominant. Uh, and like I said, QRP equipment simply because it's what you can carry with you. Uh, 14.342.5, you'll hear a lot of guys around there. If they're not, you know, you gotta avoid the uh, YL nets and there's a couple other nets in there you gotta kind of uh, watch out for. Also in 40 meters, somewhere around like 72, 50-ish, uh, somewhere in there is a good place to be on 40 meters. Uh, but there again, CW, 1460, there's a, you can almost always catch somebody on a Saturday or Sunday morning operating there uh, that's doing a, a soda activation. There again, anybody can do this. You don't have to climb a you don't have to climb a mountain. Uh, there are some places. John's Mountain's a good example. Boy, you can drive real close to the top. Uh, you just gotta 
John's Mountain, you drive into the activation zone, as they call it, and you just got your car, walk out of the activation zone, walk back in. Uh, basically, John's Mountain, you park there next to the overlook, walk back to the gravel road and walk back, and you've, you've done your thing there. Uh, sit in your shack and do it. That's easy, easy to do. Uh, and if you go and spend some time on the website, there are a bunch of, of hills and mountains around here that have never been activated. Uh, for one reason or another, some are obviously not easy to get to, but they're not that hard to get to. People just haven't done it. Uh, but if you like to hike, it's a lot of fun. Some of these places you go to, you know that you've been, you're the first person who's been there in a long time. Um, some of these Bald Mountain, Cowpen Mountain, there used to be roads there, used to be fire towers there years ago. And when you get there, you can see the remnants of those kind of things, and you know nobody's been there in a long time. Uh, safety and operating, the, couple, the two big things here, besides your just you know, basic common sense rules, uh, soda's not really making, makes, makes hiking any more dangerous than it already is, but you know, don't, it's like taking, it's like taking pictures at the edge of a precipice, you know, don't keep looking through the camera and walk off the side because you're, you know, that dropsy syndrome, they call it. Same thing happens here. Be careful of your surroundings when you've got your headphones on or you're, you know, uh, elbow deep into a, a bunch of QSOs or working a pile up. There's still snakes. There's still those kind of things. Uh, you know, don't climb crazy places. You can get within so many feet. Every mountain has its, has a different little bit of an activation zone, uh, whether it's a 10-pointer or an 8-pointer. So you don't have to get to the tippy top to activate some of these places. Uh, so if you're over in, say, East Georgia around Bell Mountain and some of those places, you don't have to climb up on like the, the ledge and fall off the side there. Uh, there are places you can get close enough to it. One of the things, as many of you know, uh, when you go up, some of these races that we do, man, the temperature can change a whole lot. You go up 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 feet, man, the, the weather changes a bunch. And some of these places, like say Bald Mountain, where you, when we started at the bottom up to the top, you've changed 2,500 feet in elevation. Yeah, the weather's different. Uh, so be prepared for that. Always wear orange during hunting season. So many of the peaks around here are gonna be in uh, either on Forest Service land or, or Georgia, uh, uh, DNR uh, protected land, and you know how the you know how some of these places are wildlife management areas. If you are there, uh, you better either have a permit. Uh, Pigeon Crockford now, if you're in the woods without a seasonal pass or some sort of hunting license, you're ticketed regardless of what time of the year it is. So be sure you know where you are when you're doing this. Also, know <laughs> whose gate you're uh, walking around. There's some great tales on the internet of people thinking, oh, it must be a forest service gate that's in the woods and end up at somebody's uh, moonshine still. So uh, not that that would ever happen around here, but that's, uh, but, you know. Uh, here's just the simple things to remember. You can't drive right up, hop out, and operate. Uh, you've got to operate from a portable power source, whatever that is, whether it's a solar panel or a battery or... Uh, you know, your bicycle with a generator on it, whatever you use there. Uh, got to carry everything with you. Uh, got to make four contacts. Uh, and you can't use repeaters. You can't, you know, it has to be a point-to-point -point contact. Can't be an assist. I know guys probably do it, but, you know, hey, relay, can't do that. It's got to be a point-to-point -point sort of a communication. Uh, Since it's all easier these days, I haven't been around, I didn't lug a, you know, a Collins radio up on the side of a hill or anything. So I'm not sure, I'm sure it's gotten easier over time, but uh, in my short tenure, everything has always been light and easy anyway. Battery technology has improved though a bunch from carrying a sealed lead acid battery to one of these lithium polymer batteries. There's some typical radios folks use. Uh, like I said, the, I stuck the MFJ on there because apparently nobody uses one but me, but the, the uh, those little monoband radios are great. They're cheap and they're they uh, work very well. Uh, the little eight, uh, Yesu 817 is probably more, I've seen more of those than any other radio there. And the KX3, uh, little L-Craft, uh, good little radio. And then whatever handy talkie you've got uh, will be good for this. It's all about what you want to carry antenna-wise. And I'll show you the little setup that I use mo uh, most often when I go. There's some pictures. There's the little MFJ up in the corner there. Uh, it's a great simple radio that has a great front end on it. Uh, 
I've got an 857 that I use sometimes. So I don't have to walk that far. It is a heavier radio. I still only run 10, 15 watts with it though because of the battery power. Uh, you know, any, any good old handy talkie that will work there for you. There's a little 817 up in the corner. It's HF and two meter 440 also. What kind of antennas you use, and there again, whatever you can get up, whatever you can take with you. A lot of the guys use out west where there's not a whole, the peaks don't have a whole lot of vegetation on top. A lot of folks use fishing poles. Uh, or they use uh, uh, fly rods, anything that's simple, easy, you can tear down and take with you. Lots of guys, the buddy pole makes a buddy stick uh, that's a glorified uh, fishing rod, but it's an extendable, collapsible. There's two or three different versions of it. They have, have one made out of fiberglass that has, uh, that puts together like a tent poles kind of that work. Uh, dipole, around here it's not too hard to find a tree or something to put a wire up of some, uh, some sort. Uh, and I'll show you the, the little setup I use. Of course, lithium polymer, lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, are the way to go now. Bug spray, if, depending on what time of the year it is, you need some sort of throw rope and a weight. I'll show you what I use. Uh, first aid kit, log and some way to log your contacts. I'm still doing, I've got an app on here to do that, but I'm still finding it easier to do a pen and pencil or uh, and piece of paper and know what the weather's gonna be like when you get there because uh, it'll, it'll probably change anyway. Here's some pictures. There's a buddy stick. Oregon there, great view. He has a little soda flag he puts on his antenna. Mount Fuji in Oregon, another pretty picture. We talked a little bit about what's close around here. Here's that map blown up, it's the same map. Uh, and you can see, and around, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of peaks around here to see, but uh, even over in Jasper, the highest one we get is only an eight uh, compared to these other three that are up here. Uh, but several around here, the uh, Ball Mountain, you can basically drive up to the top of it, get real close to the top of it, driving. Uh, easy to make it there. I so see you, the, you can go on the web, the Soda website, and, and you can go on the Soda website and see all of these uh, and play around, see where, you know, go to the east part of the state, go to Tennessee and whatnot. Like I said, you've got an app on your phone. Uh, ham log is what I use on the phone for logging when I do the Pignology app. You can get a little hook up for your iPhone to hook up to your radio if your radio's got a cat control port and it'll keep up with your uh, frequency and whatnot uh, on there. But like I said, Android and your PC, whatever you want to, if you've got a small enough laptop to take with you, take it with you. So I'm going to show you here what I've got. Uh, my setup here and then any questions we've got. Uh, like I said, alerting cell phone a buddy. Lots of the places we go around here don't have cell phone coverage, but uh, like I said, it is addictive. Once you do it a couple of times, if you've never worked a pile up anywhere that you've created, this is a lot of fun because when folks will, especially on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, you put a spot out there, people will be all over you in just a minute. Let me show you my little setup here. There's picture from Brass Down Ball when we activated it. Here's the essentials. You've got to have, there's my throw line, which is 10 pound test. Uh, here's a lug nut and wheel stud off of a deuce and a half. Makes a good throw weight. Log book, which has lots of scribbles in it because it's difficult sitting sometimes on the side of a rock to do that. Pencil. Carry more than one. Here's the power cord for the radio. Other stuff that I carry that I didn't necessarily mention, which is probably good for around here, is bear spray, uh, headlamp, or as my wife calls it, a dork light. Uh, I always take some brochures with me that I print it out on the printer because people always stop and go, "What are you doing?" There's, you know, this is like, is there, is the world coming to an end? Is there a reason you're doing this? Are you ISIS? And so that you can give out these these little things. Then you've got, yeah, that, yeah, that's right. I got in trouble in the Smokies with the park service because I was joking around. The guy goes, "What are you?" He goes, "You have government operative." I'm like, "Of course I am," and that, they didn't think that was really funny. So, so two and a half hours later, I got to go. Let's see. 
I've got everything wrapped up in tons of bubble wrap, just in case I drop my pack here. But here's my microphone. This is my little MFJ uh, radio, little 9420. I built a little kit out of QST to put a, uh, a frequency counter on there because anymore that's difficult. On a, nobody uses a dial anymore. I'm tired of asking people, what, what exactly is my frequency? Uh, so that works pretty good. And of course, even though I don't use it a whole lot, I still take it because you never can take predictions. Here's a QRP tuner that I built from a kit. And this is an old, there's a newer version that looks a whole lot nicer, but it's a simple, you know, when the LED goes out, you're tuned. So you can throw an additional capacitance in there. It's got a fixed inductor in there. It will do twin lead, but I don't ever use that. So it's a good little, good little box. And then the antenna. I do have pulling rope attached to the antenna. And this is a, this is one I made from a kit, ordered the, the insulators and the centerpiece online, and this is just copper weld. This is cut for 14300 and easy enough to carry, set up. Handles plenty of, you know, this will do plenty for 12 watts. I do not have a battery with me. I didn't want to lug that with me. But that's basically the setup. And there's the, the power cord, and I've already got ends terminated to fit on top of the battery, so plug it up and go. Sometimes if it's windy, I'll take a set of uh, headphones, a little adapter for like a set of iPhone earbuds or something like that. But this rig will also do, I added the CW board in it so you can press a button and it changes the frequency range to operate on CW. So that's basically the setup. And you get up on top of the mountain somewhere, you've got a couple of trees, you know, throw your handy dandy weight here. And in, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you're ready to operate. Uh, real simple setup, find a place to sit down that's comfortable and, and go to work. Uh, but that's the, uh, that's the basic setup. Now, like I said, when I do a, a, something that's not so, when I'm not hiking, I'll take a, like a Yaesu 857D, a little heavier radio that I can be frequency agile. This antenna tunes great on 10 meters. If the band is open, that's a good band to be on also. But real simple setup. It's a lot of fun. If anybody would like to go, we try to go sometimes once a month. Be glad to take anybody that wants to go with us. If you want to go schlepping up the side of a hill with us somewhere, uh, we'll take you. But anyway, anybody have any questions or witty comments? The, the one I use, I've got a, I'm still using a lead acid battery, a seven amp hour, like an alarm battery. You can get the, you can get a lithium iron phosphate, or LIFPO as people call it, that's got twice the capacity and weighs half as much and costs 10 times as much as the SLA. I'm not joking, that's the, you can buy a SLA like that seven amp hour SLA for literally $10 and the, the equivalent size LIFPO and almost 20 amp hours is $115. But it doesn't weigh anything. It's amazing how light it is. Uh, so yeah, that's all, I, but I can take that's with the MFJ radio and a seven amp hour battery, I can make uh, probably 60 or so contacts if they're kind of back and forth fairly quick before I start to notice the, the light just gets dimmer and dimmer. When the light goes out, you might as well stop talking on the radio. It, when it get, but it'll sit there and run until it just runs out of, you know. Like I said, I've got it down to six, seven watts before it just dies. But uh, that sometimes, you know, depending on the day it is and how fast it's, you may be doing that, maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half operating to kind of get that, you know, depending on how fast you're going. So you're doing sideband most of the time? Yeah, single sideband. I'm not, I am terrible at code. I've done it. I've got a key that, to do it. But, man, I just can't, I'm just not good enough to make contacts, especially when you're outdoors and, you know, I've got to be in a shack with headphones on and it turned up a thousand decibels to be able to even to decode Morse code. So uh, now the guy that goes with me in the club, that's all he does. Now with running that, he can go twice as long as I can on the same battery operating CW. 
with a set of keys. He's got a little set of keys he made out of uh, two pieces of copper strip on, a, on the top of an Altoids tin, and that's what he uses for his key, like a bug, and he does wonders with it with this little radio. It, it starts out, if the battery's good, 13 volts, it'll do 12 watts. That's what, the other good thing about that radio being the way it is, it, when it, it doesn't shut off when the power gets lower, act weird, it just, till it just runs out of juice, it'll keep transmitting at lower and lower wattage till it goes out. They're under $300, aren't they? Yeah, and I bought that one used from a guy at Hamfest for 175 bucks. And it's a great, those are great little radios. They, they, uh, it's amazing how well they tune. The newer ones have a fine tuning knob, also get a little tighter, but it's amazing how much you can uh, tune in the middle of a, of a bunch of junk and pick out the signal you want. The knob's a little touchy, but when it gets warmed up, it's, it won't drift. It's, it's uh, pretty good. And it's not a kit. They, they're going to sell. There is a CW only version of that that is a kit, but the SSB version is not a kit. At least they're not anymore. I don't know if they used to be. Any other questions? If you were going to do like um, uh, DSK 31, you could hook your computer up to that. I don't. I've never tried that. I've done PSK 31 with my 857 uh, with this with this computer because it's little. Uh, when I didn't have to carry it that far, but that worked okay. It's amazing. There again, on 20 meters in the Smokies. I made, uh, gosh, we made, I don't know, 25, 30 contacts in 45 minutes on PSK. That was the first international contact I made doing soda was to Belgium using PSK on a little setup like that. Same antenna on 20 meters. Hey, yes? How do you choose what frequency? It's, like I said, there's, the website has some suggested frequencies where, you know, it's kind of like uh, 14070, everybody kind of knows PSK is there. Same, it's a sort of an understand, understood. 14342.5 is in 7280-ish, somewhere in there is usually where people hang out. But some days you just gotta go where there's nobody there and hope somebody will pick you up and hope somebody will spot you, you know. The, the best way to do it is to, is to do 24 hours. If you use the, the SOTA database uh, that was listed here, the best way to do it is about 24 hours out. Uh, now, I've done shorter than that. with kind of spur of the moment. Let's go. But the, uh, you'll see these. If I can get back to the page, you'll see some of the spots. Some of the people will spot up to a week if they're planning like a, uh, an expedition type deal, but usually 24 hours is good. If, if you do something for 24 hours and you can get that frequency, the first time you call, yeah, you'll get, there'll be a pileup immediately. Yeah, the, you'll see these, uh, this one only lists uh, a few hours, but you see it goes from Tuesday back into Wednesday down here at the bottom, the upcoming activations. Uh, so folks, like I said, 24, 36 hours out there. No, it's, the only thing that they do that you'll, that's close to that is on December, 31st, guys will go camp and they'll activate one summit on December 31st, activate it again on January 1st to get the points. So at midnight, you'll hear a lot of guys, there'll be a pretty good bit of activity. But there again, it's hard to find a frequency because all these guys, if they're doing CW, you get it, you know, you kind of get in the middle of a bunch of, you know, straight key night kind of thing, you know, and so, but uh, that's the only night of the year that's really busy. Now, and there'll, there'll be several, you'll, have, you'll hear dozens of guys, uh, on New Year's Eve, but other than that, yeah, this is just a, there are some guys that are retired that you see, this WG0AT, Steve, he operates three or four days a week, just because he lives in Colorado and he's got places, matter of fact, Mount Herman is in is his backyard, so uh, he'll go there and operate uh, whenever he can, or he'll take people up there to operate, but he can drive across his county and be on two or three different peaks. So he does it all the time. Any other questions? Like I said, any time anybody wants to go or see anything else about it, I've got some of those brochures that I carry with me that aren't real informative, except to say, hey, we're not a terrorist organization kind of thing. But uh, 
you're welcome to have one of those or uh, whatnot. Just get in touch with me. Uh, if anybody wants to go and want to know any, anything else or when we're going or see any other pictures or hear any funny stories about snakes or using the bathroom in the woods, just let me know and we'll, I can, well, we can hook you up there. But yeah, K4HYJ at AWRL.net and uh, if you want to go with us and we'll go.